we want to try to set forth the evidences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how to receive. Acts 19, verses 1 to 6. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. And then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what it says. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, this is the most vital question that confronts the Christian. After a person is saved, there is no more important question than Acts 19.2. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And as Baptists, we used to translate that word since as when. It can be translated that way because Baptists and all institutional church Christians insist that you receive the Holy Spirit as some mystical experience when you believe. And so you can get out of the fact that you don't have it as a personal experience by saying, I received the Holy Spirit when I believe, because the question was, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, not have you received since or after you believed? And so there's a very good scriptural answer to that. The question is, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whether it's when or since? Do you have it? Now that's the question that's confronting Christians. The churches are concerned about many, many questions today, everything from how we should fulfill the Great Commission to how to cope with this great demonic flood that's sweeping across the earth today. But none of these questions can be answered or dealt with properly. It cannot be solved without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we must first answer this question. Have you received the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you know the experience? That is, as a personal experience, either when you believed or since you believed, but do you have the experience? Now, there's one thing about it. There's more confusion over the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the question of speaking in tongues than anything else that the churches are concerned about. There is more confusion because Christians have been mistaught, misdirected, misled, confused, and threatened about the experience, how they ought to avoid it, until they don't know what to believe. You get to the place where confusion reigns concerning this question. And this state of affairs is no accident because the enemy has crept in and sown his tares while the church has been asleep for all these centuries. The reason for all this confusion is because the enemy has sown the seeds of confusion. And most Christians are confused over the question. Satan knows that a Christian without the baptism of the Holy Spirit has no real power over him. That is a truth that can't even be debated. You never want to try to express any argument against that because you would just show how foolish you are. Because those of us who have come out of that dead experience into the living experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit know that all of those things that were impossible to do in the flesh and by effort are possible by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. That is, the fruits of the Spirit that we tried to bear and so vainly tried to bear are being manifested in the lives of those who receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, there's more evidence than just speaking in tongues. There is a changed life, not just a changed vocabulary, but a changed life. But Satan knows that a Christian without the baptism has no power over him, so he keeps him confused about it if it's just to the extent of thinking he has the experience which he received automatically and inevitably and unconsciously when he got saved. Satan knows that a church without the power of the Holy Spirit has no real power over him. He knows that 
A church without the Holy Spirit is without the spirit of truth. That is, the baptism in the members is without the spirit of truth, and therefore, those people, that church is open to his deceptions and his perversions of the truth, and this is why there's so much confusion today. Why you have, by the way, over 250 denominations is because they're all listening to different spirits. God is not the spirit of confusion. And Satan knows that Christendom cannot fulfill the Great Commission as it should without the Holy Spirit. Again, it can't be debated because missionaries will spend years on the field trying to make a few converts. And I've heard, as one said in our seminary when I used to teach there, he had two dubious converts made in 10 years. Compare that non-charismatic type ministry that's on the mission field with a charismatic ministry where time and again thousands are converted under one message. One message with the signs following. And so it's no accident that such confusion prevails because the devil has done everything he can to minister such confusion about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in speaking in tongues. And so the popular view is, and this is inspired directly from the pit, that the baptism is not for today and that tongues are of the devil. The devil has no greater victory over the church than to convince the church that speaking in tongues is not of God, that it's of him. As we so often said, it couldn't be of the devil because if it were, I would have spoken in tongues years ago because I did everything else the devil said. So speaking in tongues is not of the devil. I did that after I got saved. So Acts 19, 2 asks the question about which no Christian should have any doubt. Have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit since you believed? And yet there is a lot of doubt and a lot of confusion Christians just don't know. So we want to give you about a half a dozen evidences whether or not you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about receiving salvation or the Spirit being with you or whatever. We're talking about the experience that is subsequent to salvation the baptism of the Holy Spirit with its initial evidence of speaking supernaturally in a new language as the Holy Spirit gives you the utterance. So here are the evidences. First of all, if you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll know it. Now that isn't as elementary as it sounds. If you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will K-N-O-W, know it. I don't think anybody could really convince himself he has it if he isn't sure. <laughs> And yet there's more confusion about this question than anything else. You see, most Christians don't know if they have the baptism with all of this present-day outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the charismatics running around and confessing that they have received an Acts 2 experience. They're even less sure than before. But they think they have it, most do at least, think they have the baptism of the Holy Spirit because it's in the creed. And their church teaches that this is a mystical experience that you enter into when you're saved and join the church, like the church is a building and the Holy Spirit's residing here in the barn. Even when we're gone, he's still here and all of that. But the church is the people and he resides within the people who are his temple. Each Christian that he resides in is his temple. So it isn't some dubious, abstract, philosophical, mystical something that comes to the church and you automatically enter into it when you get saved whether you want it or not you just receive it. I've met people on the other hand who have gone beyond that and think they have the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they had a vision or they heard the voice of the Lord audibly or they had some tremendous spiritual experience whether it's a vision or the voice of the Lord or some have said I was baptized with the spirit of love and I was baptized with the spirit of joy and it just overflowed and overflowed, and my life hasn't been the same since. And I never ridicule or criticize anyone who's had an experience like that. Visions and the audible voice of the Lord. One man said, I saw a great light, and I know I have the baptism, and so on. I don't criticize that. I say, praise God for your experience. But we're talking about Acts 2, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us how they felt or what they saw, but what they experienced. Amen. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with new tongues. I've had some people get offended with me because, you know, I was trying to bless them by enabling them to see their experience was not the baptism so they could get the baptism. In fact, one man who was offended for a long time finally received and then admitted 
that he had been wrong all this time. A great light filled his bedroom. The voice of the Lord came, told him about a ministry he was going to give him. He said, I know I've been baptized in the Spirit. I said, praise God for that experience. Now you need the baptism to be able to make it effective. I've got it. Do you speak in tongues? No, I don't need that. That experience was a baptism. I said, when you get the baptism, you'll have the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, and then you'll see the difference. And eventually he did receive and admitted that he'd gotten offended with me, but that I was right about it, that the baptism is something else because he got to something else. Well, there's a woman sitting right here right now in this meeting that years ago, she came with others and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but she told me she thought she had been baptized in the Spirit for three years because she'd had a vision. And she said she didn't know the difference until she heard me teaching that there is a difference between a vision and the baptism. You see, those are tremendous spiritual experiences, but they're not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They can be in connection with the baptism, but they're not the baptism. And generally, they're not in connection. They're an experience that stands by itself. Others have said, well, I spoke, at least I think I did, once in new tongues when I received the baptism, or when I thought I did. You see, they're confused, but I've never spoken since. And others will say, well, I was prayed for to receive the Holy Spirit, but I've never spoken in new tongues, a new language supernaturally. And some people say, you have it, and others say, you don't have it, you don't have the initial evidence, and I'm confused. Well, confusion reigns. Confusion reigns among Christians concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they should not be confused about this experience. Because if you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll know it. You will know if you have it. In fact, it's very easy in a congregation this size, wherever we go, it's very easy to help people along this line. You can do as I do. You can say, all of you who are confused and not sure, as to whether or not you have the baptism, raise your hand and I can look at you. I can tell whether or not you have it just by looking at you. <laughs> and so those who raise their hands, I say, now all of you don't have it. <laughs> because, dear friends, this is one thing, if you have it, you'll know it. No one who ever had it who didn't positively know that they received the Holy Spirit. I was ministering with a brother who, in his message, he set forth how he knew he had the Holy Spirit. He said, people are always saying, well, how do you know it's for today? And how do you know you have it? And how do you know it's a genuine experience? And how can you tell that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And he said he didn't give them any theological arguments. He didn't try to answer them with his intellect. He just gave a simple, direct answer right to the point. He said, when you've been run over by a truck, you know it. <laughs> That really is more to the point than anything you could say. That's right. If a man's been run over by a truck, he'll know it. And he says, I've been run over. He said, praise God. How do I know I have it? He says, if your house is on fire, you know it. Amen. Friends, there's some things you know. And if you've got any doubt, then, well, then you're a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning. You notice here in chapter 19 and verse 2, that these men, these disciples of John, were not like most Christians today. They were not confused. In 19.2, when he says, have you received the Holy Spirit? They were not confused. They said, no, we're not confused. We don't have it. <laughs> Praise God for people who know they don't have it. For 14 years, I didn't know. I thought I had it because it was in the Baptist doctrine. You see, but praise God, they knew they didn't have it. Then if you read verse 6, they knew when they got it. If you'd have asked them then, they said, yes, we have it. If any more Pauls or Peters would have come along after they received it with the evidence of speaking in new tongues, and that's a supernatural language for anyone who is afraid of the word tongue. Nothing wrong with English tongue. So it may be Hebrew tongue, language, Polish tongue, language, Arabic tongue, language. After they received that supernatural utterance in a new language, they knew they'd receive. Amen, friends. There's no question. I'll tell you, I do not remember the date that I was saved. I know the month. It was January 52. And I'm not saying one's more important than the other, but I'll tell you, something different happens in the baptism. A truck runs over you. My life was changed when I was saved. And I know the experience January 52 on the road home from a nightclub. It happened. But I know the hour on the clock 
the date on the calendar when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that's the second evidence of whether or not you have it. You'll not only know it, but you'll know when you received it. I'm not insisting here you'd have to know the day or hour, but you will know that it's a definite day and hour. It won't be some dubious saying, well, I think I have it, and I've been to several meetings, and I've been prayed for, and they say I have it, and so on. No. If you've received the Holy Spirit, you'll know when. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a definite personal experience at a definite day on the calendar and hour on the clock is what we're saying. It's not some dubious mystical experience. Now the unbelieving church has made it a doctrine to be studied with the intellect, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a personal experience and you'll know when. Well, Ephesians 1.13 says you can know when. And that's why I insist that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience subsequent to. That means after you're saved. Because Ephesians 1.13 says it's an experience you receive after you're saved. Not automatically, inevitably, when you're saved. It can be a moment after, but it's going to be after you believe on Christ. Then you receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. If you believe and ask for it and act your faith. Verse 13, speaking of Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed. When? After that you believed. After you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, which was promised. Now, if you read John 14, 15, and 16, and Acts chapter 1, Jesus again and again says, I'm going to send you the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. That's the promise that Paul says you're sealed with after that you believe. Not before you believe, not even when you believe, but after that you believe. It's a definite experience like salvation is an experience. It's not something you confuse with anything else. And so we should let no man, however skilled he is in theology, confuse us over this issue or mislead us. This is a personal experience as much as your marriage is a personal experience, your salvation was a personal experience, our baptism in water is a personal experience. I mean, no one is ever confused about whether or not they've been immersed in water. You've been sprinkled or poured, you might question whether or not you've been baptized. That'd be a good question to raise. But if you've been immersed, there's never any question. We read in Acts chapter 8 that Philip went down to Antioch. They all believed, and we read they were baptized in water but had not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now they knew they had been baptized in water and they knew they hadn't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then Peter and John went down and corrected that deficiency and they all received the Holy Spirit. But none of those in Antioch would have said, I'm not sure whether or not I've been baptized in water. So you're not going to be in doubt about whether or not you've been baptized in the Spirit. You're going to know when it happened. No one will say, well, I guess I've been baptized in water. I guess I'm married or I guess I'm alive. So with the Holy Spirit. You'll know you have it, you'll know when you received it. For 14 years, I wasn't sure. I thought I had it because the creed said that we did. And then when I received, I knew when to receive. March the 19th, 1966 at 10 p.m., McCormick Seminary, Chicago, Illinois, is in the corner of the seminary lounge by the couch on my knees trying to exercise a little faith for what I knew was valid for today. I had discovered it was valid. I want to tell you from that moment when it happened, it no longer was a doctrine. It ceased to be a doctrine and became a living experience. I knew when to receive. So I say, I'm not insisting you'd have to remember the day you received the baptism, but you will know when you received it and that you will know it's a personal experience that happened to you. But praise God, I do remember it. I don't remember the day I was saved. I remember the month and the year. But I do remember when I was run over by that truck, <laughs> that spiritual truck. Amen. I know where, when. I know everything that happened. I spoke for two hours, supernaturally in a new language. And I'd asked for a double portion, and I got it. You get what you believe for, what you ask for. And after 14 years of believing I had something in a mystical, abstract, unconscious way, then when I received it, I saw the difference between the doctrine and the experience. So if you have the Holy Spirit, you'll know when you received it. You will. you know when you were baptized. In water, you'll know when you were baptized in the Spirit. In the sense you know it's a definite personal experience. It's not something you think you may have. 
that you think that may have happened to you and so on. Now a third evidence, if you have the baptism, you'll not only know when he came, but you'll know where the Holy Spirit came to. Now, this is very important. It's not insignificant to say that it's important for you to know where the Holy Spirit comes to when you're baptized in the Spirit. Because according to John 14, 17, the Spirit of God is with you as a Christian, but when you're baptized, He's in you. Now, we're not even going to try to raise or answer <coughs> questions that get in some people's minds about whether or not you can be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. That isn't what we're saying. We're saying what the Word of God says. John 14, 7, He's with you, He shall be in you when you're baptized in the Spirit. And he's talking there in John 14 about the baptism. And remember, Paul and all the New Testament is writing to Spirit-filled Christians. There's never the possibility that anyone doesn't have it who's a Christian. In fact, the few instances where they did not have it, like in Acts 8 and in Acts 19, they corrected that situation right away. But you will know where he comes to. He's not going to be in the creed of your church. He's not going to just be on a page in the Bible as he is to so many people. He's not going to be in your church in some mystical way and when you get saved and join that church, you enter into the baptism of the Holy Spirit experience. No, when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to know where he comes to. Because according to the prophecy in Ezekiel 36, 27, God says, I'll put my spirit within you. He's going to put his spirit in us. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're told that we, our bodies, are the temple of the Holy Spirit who resides in us. You'll know where he resides, where he locates when he comes, because he's going to be in you. Jesus said in John 7, when he sends the Holy Spirit, he's going to be in your inward parts like a river of living water flowing out of you to bless others. He's in you. John 14, 7, he's with you, he'll be in you. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, he's in you. So you're going to know He's in you because He's going to manifest His presence by affecting your language. He's going to manifest His presence by affecting your life. Both of those things. You'll know where He resides when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was with me all of those years before I received the baptism. But the very instant that I was baptized in the Spirit, His indwelling presence began to be manifested through the utterance supernaturally for two solid hours of a new language. People actually gathered around. I'd ask for that double portion, and they would go out, and it was a full gospel businessmen's meeting. They would go out and bring people in to see this anointed brother who couldn't stop speaking in new tongues. Couldn't stop, didn't want to stop. After 14 years of dead Baptist experience, <laughs> life had suddenly been manifested. Oh, I was alive, but now it was manifested. So the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit was manifested by the fact that it affected my language faculties. I was able to speak supernaturally, studied five or six languages, but here was one that I could speak and still can speak and can speak many, many like that because he's given me also the gift of diverse tongues without any effort. I could type a letter to you while I spoke in new tongues because it doesn't come out of the head, it comes out of the Spirit. So any time that you want to know whether or not you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can just lift up your voice in faith. Amen. And he'll manifest himself. A person, now listen carefully, without the baptism cannot manifest his presence in that supernatural way. No, there's no argument that will ever put that down. No way to gainsay that, that statement. That only the person with the baptism can manifest the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit any time they want, just by lifting their voice and Allah Masi, Rasam Baya Loshadaya Barati, Mosaribida, Lashambreti Kuri Adabaso. Hallelujah. For I dwell in my people, saith the Lord, and I am to be received by faith. And the Spirit of God, which then dwells within you, will manifest himself at your will as you lift up your voice in faith, saith the Lord. Amen. So, praise God. No thought. Now I'll take a little thought. Ani, let's see. Ani medaber ivrit meat meod. That's Hebrew. I can speak a little Hebrew, I said. But that's out of the head. Ani meraber ivrit miat meod. Miat meod. Very little, I said. 
That comes out of intellect. I had to stop a moment and think about how to put it together. In fact, I thought I was putting it together pretty good one day in Jerusalem when the guard at the gate, I told him in Hebrew, I teach Hebrew in the seminary, and he corrected my sentence structure, <laughs> which kept me from coming back and boasting about how I use my Hebrew in Palestine. <laughs> But I wouldn't have starved to death. I could use enough to know not to ask for a ham sandwich. And, uh, <laughs> for <laughs> but praise God, I'll tell you, I spoke all over the land of Palestine supernaturally and never had to take thought. If you have the Holy Spirit, you'll know where He is. He's residing in there, and He will manifest His presence as you lift up your voice in faith. Hallelujah. Amen. And a person without the baptism cannot have that evidence of His indwelling presence. Now, we're to the place in the end time where we just, well, we ought to tell it like it is if we had 10,000 more years. But time is so short, we're just going to have to tell you that if you have the baptism, you will speak in new tongues. Amen. And that's going to be a great blessing to you through those trials you go through Amen. when you can pray in the Spirit and intercede in the Spirit, Romans 8. And anyway, the Scriptures say we ought always to pray in the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. And I don't know how you do that except to speak in new tongues. And so I know where He is. Like Ezekiel the prophet said, He's residing in me, and I know He's there. Because he affects my language. And secondly, I said, I know his presence is there because he affects my life, my conduct. He changed it. I mean, friends, you're changed when you're saved. But when the Holy Spirit comes, you are empowered now to make drastic, revolutionary, permanent spiritual changes in your life. And those fruits of the Spirit are there to be manifested if you just yield yourself to the Spirit. I don't want to digress and say I recognize most charismatics are not sitting under any end time teaching and they don't know what to do with the baptism. They stopped at Pentecost, camped out on Pentecost Hill and refused to come down. They're not going anywhere. But there's a deeper life and a deeper walk and a fullness of the Spirit for you. This is the purpose of the baptism. And so those who yield themselves to the Spirit after they're baptized in the Spirit find their life is greatly transformed. Things that I could not control or handle are overcome. Just as one brother said, you know, there's some things that I've forgotten that used to be problems. I said, that's right. It's because they just are removed by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit as you yield to Him. Now, I don't mean I had some great, gross... I wasn't robbing banks and all, but there are things in every one of our lives that it takes the Holy Spirit to conquer, a dying out to self and so on. A person, you know, without the baptism is not going to have the victory. They're going to accomplish some things in the effort of the flesh, the will of the flesh, and the power of the flesh. But I found the more I tried, the more I failed. And really, if a person is honest, you'll find that's true. Well, somebody says, I must have received the Holy Spirit when I was saved because my life was changed when I was saved. That's right. But that isn't what we're asking this morning. The question is, have you changed any since? Yeah, we know you were changed when you were saved. Any man being Christ, he's a new creature. But have you changed any since? There's where the problem lies. Are you growing? Are you bearing that fruit? Is your life a ministry in the body and is it fruitful? Amen. Well, that's why it gets quiet, because we have to study about that. Yes, I'm a new creature, that's right. And I change, yes, but are you changing from glory into glory? Are you changing every day? Yes, yeah, somebody says, I saw five people saved last year. Well, praise God, get the baptism with your zeal, it'll probably be 50 or maybe 500. <laughs> yes, what's the quality and quantity of the fruit you're bearing is the question you have to ask. So... If you have the baptism, you'll know it. You'll know when you received it. You'll know it's a definite experience, that is. And you'll know where he is. He's residing there. He's changing you. He's affecting and changing your language. You can pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Paul says, I pray in the Spirit more than you all. Yeah. He thought it was important. It's a good answer to those who say that speaking in tongues is the least gift. Which he didn't say, but he says, I pray in tongues more than you all. Yes, he said, 
if I'm going to edify you, then I'm going to prophesy to you. But he says, I pray in tongues more than all of you put together. And the Corinthians were praying so much in tongues instead of prophesying and teaching like they should so that people could understand what they were saying that he had to regulate it. Regulate the public utterance. And he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. That must have been most of the time. Well, that's most of the time with me. I suppose at least 90% of my praying is in the Spirit. There's some things you can't pray in the Spirit about because you have to objectify them in English with your intellect. Lay them before the throne. But once I lay them before the throne, then the intercession starts in the Spirit, where the power is, where there's effectiveness, because the Spirit of God, Romans 8, is making intercession according to the will of God. All right, we've got a book on why the Christian ought to pray in the Spirit. The Christian's threefold ministry through prayer in the Spirit. Christians who don't have it ought to have that because praying in the Spirit isn't something you do initially when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then stop. But you have a ministry to yourself, to others, and to the Lord. The Lord is glorified when you pray in the Spirit to Him because then you're praying prayers with words that can't be uttered but thoughts and expressions come through the Spirit that you couldn't utter with the intellect in 10,000 years. If you put all the brain power in the world together, it would be just nothing compared to what an uneducated person can minister to God by praying in the Spirit. Words that can't be uttered. See, God ministers to Himself through you as you lift up your voice in love and faith to Him. And God wants to be worshipped in the Spirit. That's also... 1 Corinthians 14, that we speak to God mysteries. Well, I don't know what those mysteries are, but Paul says your spirit's being blessed and God is being blessed. So if my spirit's being edified, whether or not my flesh feels any different after I get down, my knees may hurt even. So my flesh may not feel any better, but my spirit is strengthened and I'm edified. So there's a whole ministry in the Spirit. That's why we wrote the book. We had so many questions on, well, I spoke once, or I speak occasionally, or I pray in tongues if I get anointed, or in a public meeting sometimes. Well, you ought to pray in the Spirit every day. Amen. Well, what if you don't feel like it? Pray anyway. Amen. People who pray in English and don't have the baptism don't wait till they feel like praying to pray in English. So why do you wait till you feel like praying to pray in the Spirit? Amen. Well, if you pray in the Spirit, you may get feeling like it too. Amen. If you're filled with the Spirit, fourthly, as A.W. Tozier said, I got this from his little book. You ought to get acquainted with Tozier's writings. He was spirit-filled, a charismatic Christian Missionary Alliance minister. Tremendous depth in his teachings and writings. I think I have most or all of his books. When I was searching the Word and everything to find out if this was a valid experience for today, I'd had the witness it was. Among all the books, you couldn't read every chapter, every page, but among all the books, I turned to a chapter where he deals with the Holy Spirit. And lo and behold, here's a man that I had a lot of respect for before had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said, and this is my fourth point, if you have the Holy Spirit, if you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive it instantaneously and completely. No one was ever filled with the Spirit gradually. Now you see... That's what I'd been teaching for so many years and where the denominations are. They confuse the fullness of the Spirit, which is a gradual growing up into the likeness of Christ, Ephesians chapter 4. Confuse that with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is an instantaneous experience, a complete filling immediately. It's not a gradual filling. So Tozier said, if you seek to be filled or baptized gradually, you'll never receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said it is a definite instantaneous experience subsequent to salvation and when you receive it you'll know you've got it and so we are not to confuse the fullness of the Spirit with the baptism of the Holy Spirit we're not to confuse the fullness of the Spirit with being filled with the Spirit because being baptized in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit are synonymous terms in the book of Acts in Acts 1 Jesus said you'll be baptized in the Spirit in Acts 2 when they received it it says they were filled with the Spirit now, that isn't a gradual feeling. And so the terms gift of the Spirit, baptized with the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit are all synonymous. That is the same in the New Testament. But the fullness of the Spirit in Ephesians 3 is the fullness of Christ in Ephesians 4. Paul prays that we might be filled with all the fullness of God in chapter 3 of Ephesians. Chapter 4, he tells us what that fullness of God is. 
It's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it is the fullness of Christ as we grow up in him that we might come into maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And he goes on in verse 16 of Ephesians 4 and shows you that's a growth. But if you turn to Acts chapter 2, you can see here that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not to be confused with the fullness a gradual growing up into the likeness and image of Christ that a spirit-filled believer is to experience. But the baptism is an instantaneous, complete experience. Chapter 2, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, over in verse 5 of chapter 1, Jesus said, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Now there he speaks of it as a baptism in the Spirit. And in chapter 2, verse 4, when it happened, it says they were filled with the Spirit. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling with the Spirit are the same experiences. And as Tozier says, if you seek to be filled or baptized gradually, you'll never receive the baptism because that's confusing it with God's fullness or the fullness of the Spirit. You see, Acts 2 tells us that it was on the day of Pentecost when they were filled. You know, it wasn't over weeks and months and years of yielding to the Spirit they were filled. It was on a certain day, day of Pentecost. And he says the Holy Spirit came suddenly. He didn't come gradually or continuously over a period of weeks and months and years and fill them. But he came suddenly, and then we read in verse 4 that they were all filled. Now to be filled is filled. There's no such thing as being half full of the Holy Spirit. You may be half yielded to the Spirit, but they were not a quarter filled or half filled. You know the difference. I mean, if you go to the refrigerator and want a glass of milk and there's only a half a glass there, you know the difference between a full bottle of milk and a full glass of milk and a half a glass. Back in the Depression days, we used to buy 25 cents worth of gas for our $25 cars. That's about what cars cost, and that's all the money we had. Put a quarter's worth of gas in, don't splash the sides, we'd tell them. And we knew we didn't have a full tank of gas. That's what I'm saying. We didn't even want them to splash the sides. Get it all on the bottom where it'll do the most good. And when they were baptized in the Spirit, they weren't a little baptized or partly baptized or partly filled. It says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. A young woman once said to me where I was teaching on the fullness, the deeper life of the Spirit, she said, well, what you're teaching on the fullness, that as we yield to the Spirit, then more of the fullness of Christ is manifested in us. She says, that's what our church teaches is the baptism. I said, I know that because I taught it for 14 years. Because you already have the baptism, you see, and now as you yield to that baptism, you come into the fullness of God. And so I said, no, the baptism is an experience subsequent to salvation, and it's a definite experience. Now, the 20th century church, of course, is teaching a gradual filling because it's lost the Acts 2 experience of a personal experience. Well, I sought to be filled for 14 years, the more I sought, the emptier I got. I really believe for you to be effective in this end time move of God, you've got to experience an emptiness before the filling. I've seen some receive because others were, and God will honor their faith. That's the remarkable thing about it. God will honor a person's faith. I've seen people receive and then never do anything with it. We've got thousands of charismatics have never gone beyond Pentecost in all the ways we've said so often. They don't even know what to do with the baptism. They just go right back in their dead old churches and just sit there and vegetate. Nothing ever happens. What they do with it? They don't even pray in the Spirit, most of them. And in a thousand other ways, people are not using the experience. I think if a person experiences an emptiness before he's filled with the Spirit, then that person will never be the same. So the more I sought to be filled in my Baptist way, the emptier I got. And so when I received it, I received the filling. In the baptism, it was all the same experience. So if you're filled, as Tozier says, it was an instantaneous, 
once for all, complete filling of the Holy Spirit. That is as far as the baptism is concerned. It's not a gradual filling. Then, fifthly, if you have received the Holy Spirit, if you have received, it will be because you exercise faith for it and ask for the experience. Now, contrary to the popular view in the churches, which say that you somehow mystically enter into this experience when you're saved, no, those who received the baptism were never baptized in the Spirit unconsciously or automatically, but they ask for the experience. Luke 11:13. he says, I'll give you the Holy Spirit if you ask for it. Like he said to one brother when his wife was dying, why does she have to die? He says, she's dying because you don't ask me to heal her. He loved her. God loves all of his children. He loves you. He wants to baptize you in the Spirit, but he isn't going to if you don't ask him. Oh, I know somebody that was awake in the middle of the night speaking in tongues. So do I. I've met one or two out of the thousands who didn't receive that way. So what does that prove? God didn't ask Paul's opinion on the road to Damascus. He wasn't in a revival. He didn't ask those Indonesians their opinion when he baptized them in the Spirit over in Indonesia and all the miracles that resulted from that. Presbyterians. We're talking about the scriptural way. God can do what he wants. He's sovereign. And occasionally he just reaches down and will take a heathen right out of Africa or South America or China or America, <laughs> U.S., <laughs> U.S. of A., and just turn them upside down. But generally they're going to have to hear that word and make a response to it. See, God can deal directly and sometimes does. I know a man, the day after I received, sat at his table, and he was filled with the Spirit and glad he had the baptism. He said, I knew nothing about it. I think he was a Presbyterian. He said, I just awakened in the night speaking in tongues. Woke up and I was speaking in tongues. Had to ask somebody what it was. Finally found out I had the baptism. Praise God. If God wants to do it that way. Didn't happen to me that way. It isn't going to happen to most. They're going to have to ask for it. Well, I've had people say, bless their hearts, they've got more answers for missing God's blessings. I never saw so many arguments for wanting to miss God's best. I've had people say to me, oh, I've asked God for all he has. I want all you have, Lord. And so they'll tell you, well, now, I know the baptism is not for today because it was. I would have it. I've asked God to give me everything. Well, you know what I tell people like that? You'd have never gotten saved praying that prayer. No, you wouldn't. Oh, Lord, if it's your will and if salvation's for today and if I'm no exception, save me. Well, you're not going to get any promise praying that way. Why? Of course, they really don't want it, and so they just throw out kind of a general. They see what's happening. They see these way out people like us, that their lives are changed, and they know that something's happening. And what God's doing, he isn't doing in a corner. It's happening all over the world. And so they just kind of, well, they're not sure. And Lord, if it's for today or for me, give me the experience because I want all you've got. Well, they never receive that way because that isn't faith. I mean, people can seek and tarry the rest of their lives and never receive until they exercise a little faith. Sometimes people will say, well, I know a man that sought and tarried for 20 years before he received. I say, yes, he sought and tarried for 20 years and then received the day he started to believe. That's right. Jesus doesn't say here in Luke 11, 13, to ask and then seek and tarry to see if it's my will. If it is, then you're going to receive. No, he says... If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, whatever the denominational creeds and the theology of the commentaries say to the contrary, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that you ask for, and you ask in faith. He said it was. Whatever he's talking about there, if someone doesn't want to accept the fact that he's talking about the baptism, and I've seen people receive because they believe that is the baptism, but whatever you want to make that verse mean about it not being baptism or just receiving more of the Spirit or whatever, you're not going to get it till you ask for it. And so whatever it means, you've got to ask. And so since we know that it is the baptism he's talking about there, then you'll receive the Holy Spirit when you ask. 
You're not going to receive automatically or unconsciously. It just doesn't happen that way. We're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And seeking and tearing is an evidence of a lack of faith. Just come to the Lord, come to the point, make it simple, and you'll find out God is waiting on you to exercise a little faith. And when you do, you receive. I was speaking in a Pentecostal church right here in Indiana several years ago. At the close of the meeting, we were having a meal with the pastor and his wife after the meeting was over. I noticed he looked a little worried and confused all through the meal, and finally he shook his head. He said, I don't understand. He said, I'm really confused. Now, he's Pentecostal church, you see. And we're not knocking Pentecostals because we have it because they got it first. But he said, I'm confused. He said, our denomination teaches to tell the people to come to the altar and to seek and to tear, and you have to pray through to receive. He says, that's the way we do it. And that's the only way I've ever done it. And he says, yet you and your wife get down there among the people and lay your hands on their head and they're just receiving like that. He says, how can that be when we've been taught to seek and tarry? Well, I said, brother, that's a very easy answer. If the Holy Spirit had not yet come, had not been sent, was not yet given, then you'd have to seek and tarry. That's what they did on the day of Pentecost. I said, if the Holy Spirit were lost, you'd have to seek to find him. I said, he's here, he's come. And I said, regardless of what might have worked in the past, you know, the early outpouring in 1900, they had to seek and tarry for a while because the church had been in unbelief for centuries. Now, when we make a statement like that, there are always those who had the baptism down through history. They just aren't recorded in much history. I said there at the turn of the century, 1900, they had to tarry a while before it happened because the church had been in unbelief too long. Now, actually, they wouldn't have had to have tarried if someone would have taught them a little faith. How to receive. But after all, if you haven't been taught the simple steps of receiving, you can make it hard. Even though I'd been walking on many of the promises of God by faith for 14 years, I didn't know how to receive the Holy Spirit. Even after I saw it was valid and for today, I sought and tarried for three weeks. I fasted, prayed, made restitution, begged, pleaded, did everything that you don't do to receive the Holy Spirit. See, that isn't faith. That's trying to get good enough to receive. And you need the Holy Spirit to be good enough to get good enough. Well, after three weeks and no one out of all charismatics didn't run into anyone that told me how simple it was to receive. Hallelujah. And when I found out how to receive, I acted my faith and it happened that night at McCormick Seminary. Even up there, they didn't tell me how to receive. They just said, as far today, and everybody in the room, must have been 50 in there at least, that were receiving the baptism and deliverance. Everybody received everything but my wife and I. We weren't receiving anything. No one had told us how. And finally, the Spirit of God said, as soon as you're ready to act your faith, it'll happen. And so, in simple faith, I just lifted up the sound of my voice and it happened like that immediately. There was no feeling with it for two minutes either, but I'll tell you, after two minutes of exercising a little faith, speaking what he gave me without any feeling, and I found out the baptism isn't feeling, it's faith, Amen. and the anointing and assurance will come if you'll act your faith, whether it's in an instant or a minute or two minutes later. With me, it, those two minutes seemed like 2,000 years of feeling foolish. This must be the Lord. The devil said all the time, you're making it up. You're making those words up. You don't know what they mean. Or they sound like Hebrew. They sound like Greek. Both languages of which I had studied. And so after two minutes of faith, then all heaven opened up. All heaven came down. Glory filled my soul. For two hours, they couldn't turn me off. All of the formal, rigid, Baptist, broom, Stick stiffness went out of my back and arms went toward heaven and it's hard to keep them down since. Well, it does something for you. So what I'm saying is this, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something to be received by faith. So we simply, in that church, we were telling the people how to receive then laying hands on them they were. And I said, Regardless of what happened on the day of Pentecost, they had to tarry because the Holy Spirit had not yet come. Regardless of what happened at the turn of the century, after 19 centuries of unbelief, they had to tarry for a while. At least they thought they did. At least they did tarry for a while. I said, now you don't have to tarry. I said, there's the evidence. People in his church that had been seeking for years received. In fact, had a church full of people didn't have the baptism. 
only about three people, and he was one of them, in a Pentecostal church were baptized in the Spirit. His whole board, nobody on the board had it. That's the state of affairs that I've run into in the Pentecostal churches. These are second, third generation Pentecostals, most of them. And they've told me that. They say, we need this teaching on faith. We don't have teachers. We've got evangelists. We don't have teachers, common teachers. Not all of them are offended by me saying that God has no grandchildren. That's right. Just because your daddy was a Pentecostal doesn't mean you enter into the blessings. All he has is children. Each person has to make his commitment to Christ and ask for the Holy Spirit and so on. I was in another Pentecostal church for 11 days. Of course, they all teach to come to the altar and seek and tarry. That's the way to receive. But see, that isn't faith. That's works, trying to work it up, trying to break through. Paul tells us in Galatians 3 that you receive the Holy Spirit by faith. Yes, he said that. He said, do you receive the Holy Spirit by faith or works? He says, by faith. And he said the promise in verse 14, the promise of the Holy Spirit is by faith. He says you receive the promise of the Holy Spirit by faith, Galatians 3, 14. Look it up and read it. And he says in verses, I believe, 5 and 6, that you receive by faith. So I was in this church. I would just go to the altar. At that time, it was not when my wife would get on and minister the Holy Spirit with me. She has in many of the meetings... The Lord has given her a gift. I don't have time, you know, to try to instruct a person that's been in 20 years of unbelief and take 20 minutes up there when you've got 100 people waiting for prayer. If they're not speaking in tongues within 30 seconds or a minute, I just pass them on to her, and they always do. That's a gift God's given her. I mean, even the hard cases. <laughs> the ones, I mean, that have been brainwashed about how to receive, and in Chicago once, where the whole crowd around them trying, you know how they do it at the meetings, they try to pray you through to the baptism, and they get to shouting and pounding you on the back, and one of them was working his jaw up and down. <laughs> oh, she says, get away from him, that isn't faith, that isn't the way you do it, and she whispered in his ear for about 30 seconds, like that. <laughs> And so that's what I was doing. I would just whisper in their ear. You know, I was instructing them how to receive, how to release their faith, and they were receiving. And one night after a Nazarene pastor received, and you could hear him for a mile, I guess, <laughs> speaking in new tongues, the pastor couldn't stand it any longer. Pentecostal pastor, and he ran up while I was still ministering, got on the PA and said, let's face it, folks, let's face it. We as Pentecostals have missed it. You don't have to shout. You don't have to pound them on the back. You don't have to seek and tarry. It's faith. It's faith. You receive by faith. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, if you're a Christian, friends, you're eligible right now to receive the Holy Spirit. You don't have to wait. He's a gift that's already been sent, and He just awaits your exercise of faith. Well, I've been blessed by some Pentecostals that have seen that the message of faith is valid today because I've been blessed by their message on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But if you're a Christian and you haven't received, I can give you four quick reasons why you haven't. Well, one is what we're telling you here. You haven't asked. Jesus said to ask. I can give you about four reasons quickly why you don't have the Holy Spirit if you're a Christian. One, you haven't asked. If you have asked, you haven't asked in faith. And see, it doesn't work by just asking and asking and asking. Faith asks once and believes it has received. So you either haven't asked or you haven't asked in faith. Or as some, I've met a few of these, they don't ask on God's terms. Would you believe there are those who think they can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit without the initial evidence? Yeah. I've seen it. Maybe a week later they come and tell you, you don't know why they don't receive because they're so hungry and so zealous for the experience. Then a week later or so they'll come and tell you, well, I want it without speaking in tongues. Or why do I need to speak in tongues? It might offend my Lutheran friends or whatever. Well, you're not going to receive on your terms. So you either don't ask, you don't ask in faith, you don't ask on God's terms, and that is with the evidence. I don't know why anyone would want to receive anything from God except God's way. must be all right because he's the one that originated the idea of speaking in tongues. That's the initial evidence. You see, a universal consistent evidence that everyone could recognize immediately. See, if we all had visions and heard voices and another one had an anointing of love and somebody else spoke in tongues and somebody else 
fell out in a faint or whatever, you'd never know when they were baptized. But when the initial evidence is always the same, speaking supernaturally in a new language, the Spirit gives you utterance and we can recognize it. So if you don't want it on God's terms. Or maybe, fourthly, you didn't act your faith. Yes, you've got to act your faith. There's no such thing as receiving the Holy Spirit and not acting your faith. And that simply means when we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there isn't getting off your medicine. That's healing. It isn't going giving a confession to the church, I'm saved, or to the world, I'm a new creature in Christ. That's salvation. It isn't doing something as evidence that you believe God will send the money and so you're making plans ahead of time to spend the money that you claim or to pay off the debt or whatever. There's only one way you can act your faith in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that's to shut up speaking English and lift up your voice in faith and let the Holy Spirit give you the utterance. You put words and syllables of that new language on your lips. You can't speak two languages at once. So many people, I've heard them, praise God, thank you, Jesus, believe I have received. Oh, Lord, you know how much I need it. And, of course, the obvious answer is we always tell them you can't speak two languages at once. Act your faith. Praise God all you want, but praise him in that new language he wants to give you at this stage. And time and again, we've seen them receive. And so... If you're over the question of the possibility of receiving, you can receive this morning or you can receive any time. You must be over your doubts. You must be willing to receive God's way on God's terms. And then lastly, sixthly, if you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll have the supernatural sign. You'll have the scriptural sign. If you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll have the scriptural sign. What is it? Acts 2 says they spake in new tongues. Acts 10 said they spoke in new tongues. Peter said that's how we knew they had received the baptism. We heard them speaking with new tongues like we did. Acts 19 said the scriptural sign is speaking with new tongues. Right away the evidence comes. Mark 16, Jesus said my people will speak with new tongues. That's the evidence. That is the supernatural sign. You won't have the baptism as some think they do without the supernatural sign. You'll have it with the sign. A woman once said to me, when I was teaching on this subject, she said, I'm confused because our church teaches that the baptism is valid, but that speaking in tongues is not for today. And said, now today you said that the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking supernaturally in a new language. And to say the least, I'm confused because our church teaches the baptism without tongues. You say that if you have it, you will have the evidence. Well, I said... There's a very simple solution to that. I wish all problems were that simple to solve. I said, why don't you just forget what you heard this morning? If you will forget all you've been taught by your denomination and go home, take the book of Acts. Yes. See, I'm willing to let people stay with the word. Yes. Then they'll find out whether I'm with the word or their church or whatever's with the word. I said, if you're willing to do this, I can prove to you that it's genuine if you forget what you've been taught, whether it's today or over the past years, and take the book of Acts. Now listen carefully what I told her to do. I said, take the book of Acts. And if you're sincere, you really want the baptism, you get into the book of Acts, and if you get through chapter 28 and don't have the baptism, forget it. It's not for you. Now sometimes you have to talk pretty strong to people. And some of you are still in the marshmallow pink tea realm on some of these things. You better... That's right. You have to talk straight sometimes. In fact, you know, I was ruling her out as a candidate if she didn't receive after 28 chapters. About an hour or two later, the phone rang. You can guess who was on it. She said, guess what? What? She said, I couldn't get past chapter 10 that happened. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, what happened? The baptism. Oh, I said, with the evidence? With the evidence. I said, let's hear it. Over the phone? I said, over the phone. And she cut loose with it, with the evidence. Amen. Well, that settled it for her. It'll settle it for you. I'll leave it with the Word of God. If you are sincere, if you really want to know whether it's what we say that it is an experience for today or whether or not it's what the popular view is, it's not for today, take the book of Acts. Be willing not even to touch a commentary till you get through. And if you can get through 
the book of Acts and you're sincerely asking for the Holy Spirit, you can't get past those passages. You know where she got to? Cornelius' house. She read Acts 2 many times. That's where all the controversy was, Acts 2. She got over to Acts 8 and saw the baptism, all the Samaritans, and she couldn't get past Cornelius' house and got baptized in spirit. Nobody there just lifted up her voice in faith. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to give you four simple steps to receive. If you're here this morning without the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you're over your doctrinal confusion and questions about its validity for today or for you, here are four simple steps to believe, to ask, to confess, and to act. Well, that's all. That's all there is. Believe what God promises you concerning the Holy Spirit. You know where that's found? Are you a Christian this morning without the baptism of the Holy Spirit or you don't know if you have it or your church teaches contrary to what you've heard this morning? Will you stay with the word? Believe what God says. Take God seriously. Most Christians don't take God seriously. If they did, they'd fear and tremble about how they treat His word and His promises. Look at Acts 2.38 and 2.39. Then Peter said to them, they said, what must we do to be saved? Peter said, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, no Christian can ever live with this if he will just honestly allow the Holy Spirit to confront him with what is said here. No one can get past 39 if they're sincere. If they get past it, I say they're not sincere. That's all I can say. For Peter said, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and with the evidence of tongues, of course, because that's how they received it, the promise is unto you, that's the Jews he was talking to, to your children, that's their descendants, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. Not only you and your descendants, but to all that are far off, which would be us, obviously. But very clearly, the next phrase includes us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everyone that God saves. As many as the Lord calls, are eligible for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now you can't get past that. So believe the word. So believe you're a candidate for it. That you're eligible. That's the first step to receiving. That's all it takes. That's all you need is verses 38 and 39. Then secondly, ask for the Holy Spirit. We've already covered this. Luke 11, 13. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? You're going to have to ask. Ask and then confess. Confession is important. I don't mean now that there's going to be a time gap between the asking and the receiving of an hour while you go somewhere and confess it. That isn't what I'm saying. But confess to the Lord. Or if you receive here, confess here. That is, confess to the Lord here. Don't wait an hour and say, I believe I have received. That's what we mean by confession. So many don't make that confession. And to hear yourself say it often will do something for your faith. Amen. Father, I ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit because it's promised. As your child, I ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe I now receive in Jesus' name. That's your confession. That's your confession. I believe I now receive in Jesus' name. And then act on your faith. You see... In every instance when people are baptized in the Spirit, and we've prayed for countless hundreds, countless hundreds, who have received in every instance when they received, they spoke in new tongues. So act on your faith. The scriptural evidence, as we've said, is a supernatural sign of speaking in new tongues. Determine you'll not speak a word of English. This is not the time to do like so many begin to praise the Lord and say hallelujah or thank you Jesus or Lord, you know how badly I need this experience why don't I receive it? And this is the third time I've asked. And that isn't faith. You say, well, I don't know what to say. Don't take thought for what to say. Don't concern yourself with what to say because it doesn't come out of the mind but the heart, the spirit. We read in Acts 2, 4, the disciples spoke 
in new tongues as the Spirit gave them the words to utter. You see, you've got to do the speaking. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit spoke. The Holy Spirit empowered them to speak. They spake as the Spirit gave them the words to utter. Now, it took me three weeks, as I say. After I decided that experience was valid and for me, it took me three weeks to see that. That's the verse that enabled me to receive after three weeks of seeking and tearing with no one to tell me that that wasn't faith, you see. And when I lifted up my voice, as I said, for two minutes I felt foolish. Most people don't feel foolish for two minutes, but I did. But God had to humble that whatever it was and cause me by an act of faith to exercise my faith. So for two minutes I spoke two or three syllables of just meaningless whatever to me. But in faith and feeling foolish, afraid somebody might hear me, I had my head down in my arms in the corner, kneeling at the couch. Oh, the devil said, if anyone hears that, how foolish, how foolish. I just kept ignoring him, telling him to be gone and praying right on through with my two or three little syllables. And then I learned the brother who told me about it, who taught in the seminary where I did, he said, well, I had one word for about, I think it was three months. Every time he had opportunity, he'd just utter that one little word in new tongues. And then God honored his faith one day and it came forth. Why sometimes it's that way is another subject. But nevertheless, dear friends, determine you won't speak English and it has to come out new tongues. <laughs> if you're going to speak and it isn't English, and you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's going to give you utterance. You see, you'll have to consciously speak English. But if you determine not to, it's going to be the new tongues. Now, some have missed it because they've not been taught this. They've been waiting on a feeling, an anointing, a vision, an experience. One woman said, my wife was ministering to her. She said, oh, I don't feel anything, don't feel anything. Well, she said, receiving isn't, feeling is faith. Oh, if I don't feel anything, I don't want it. <laughs> so I don't think she ever received it either. But this is where people are confused. It isn't feeling is faith. As you act your faith, the feeling, it isn't feeling, but the assurance and the anointing will follow. But it has to follow faith. Galatians 3, did you receive the Spirit by feeling, by works? No, he said by faith. Amen. And so those four simple steps, to believe what God has said, it's for you and all that he calls, ask for it, ask in faith, confess you believe you have received. Time and again, I have to tell people, tell the Father you believe you have received. And when they do that, that's what releases their faith. So it's very important to confess that to the Lord. I believe I have now received. In spite of what you feel, that has nothing to do with it then act your faith and it'll happen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Father, in Jesus' name, let the word bear fruit in the hearts of all of us, especially those who have not entered yet into the fullness of the experience that you have for your people, that you've promised us from the day of Pentecost that Peter spoke until this hour we've not received simply because of unbelief. And God, we pray through the word that faith will be ministered to hearts wherever this message goes to receive the end time anointing and power which is available to your church. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.